Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, uh, it is uh, our big, big honor uh, to have uh, Ambassador Pake, Ambassador of uh, EU uh, to Japan, uh, to talk about uh, uh, EU's uh, policy regarding uh, innovation, uh, Green Deal, economic security, uh, so and so. Uh, Ambassador Pake, uh, probably uh, many of uh, the audience know uh, very much, uh, very uh, well knowledge about uh, EU policy, EU strategy. So it is a, a good opportunity uh, for us to learn uh, more uh, about uh, EU policies and strategies. Uh, and uh, also we have a, a good uh, commentator uh, Tamura-san, uh, Tamura uh, no, uh, many of the audience, of course, know, uh, experts uh, on uh, trade uh, and innovation and uh, regional uh, policy. Uh, Tamura-san uh, has been just uh, appointed uh, the uh, leader of the uh, JETRO uh, in Paris, uh, so he is uh, soon uh, to be dispatched to Paris. Uh, thank you very much, Tamura-san, for joining us. And actually, I am uh, Yasuo Tanabe. Uh, I am a consulting fellow of the, the RETI, but uh, I'm a managing director of the uh, EU-Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation. EU-Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation is a joint venture between uh, the European government, EU government, and Japanese government, METI. Uh, we ha have been running uh, the organization since 1987 to promote mm -hmm. uh, EU-Japan uh, collaboration on uh, business and industry affairs. So today, uh, I think it is uh, very timely uh, to cover uh, EU-Japan uh, relationships because uh, uh, last week on July 13th, mm -hmm. there was an EU-Japan summit meeting uh, in Brussels, Prime Minister Kishida uh, was there. And uh, actually, a little before uh, July 4th, uh, Commissioner Bruton uh, has come to Japan uh, to discuss uh, many issues uh, like uh, chips, digital partnership, uh, economic security, hydrogen, uh, defense industry, and so on and so uh, and, uh, we actually, the Center for, uh, uh, EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation, EU delegation, and RIETI uh, had uh, at that time uh, a seminar on uh, economic uh, security. Uh, so, in this uh, series, uh, we have been deepening our understanding, our consideration of the uh, EU Japan partnership. So, today, I hope uh, we can further. Uh, elaborate, uh, we can uh, heighten uh, our EU-Japan uh, partnership uh, relations. So I will ask uh, uh, Ambassador Pake to make an initial speech for, uh, say, 30 minutes or so, whatever time you like. Then uh, I will invite uh, uh, Tamura-san to make a comment. Then we can go into uh, Q&As. Uh, so, uh, Ambassador Floor is yours. Tanavisan, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, uh, um, uh, everyone. I think it's only a small exaggeration to say that ever since I arrived in Japan in September of last year, I had hoped to be invited by Rieti uh, for a seminar uh, as uh, we are having today. Why? Because Rieti is, of course, a very prestigious institute, but also because Rieti brings um, in these meetings all of you which are joining us online today. And many of you, uh, I'm well aware, are actors of uh, the administration, the industry here in Japan. And many of you are, therefore, partners of the European Union and operator 
of this um, increasingly uh, key relationship between Japan and the European Union. So um, with the invitation uh, and the subject which we discussed with Tanabe-san, I think I probably I slightly overreached in terms of the scope of the presentation. I will still try to do it in 20, 25 minutes um, so that we can then indeed uh, also discuss uh, how Japan and Europe are working together. What I want to try to do um, in this initial uh, opening is to give you a bit of a sense of uh, wha what innovation and research and innovation are about uh, in Europe. I will, of course, connect that to policies because research and innovation, uh, research stands in itself, obviously, but research and innovation also need to be connected to societal and uh, policy objectives. So I will start uh, with that and in particular with what is at the center of public policy making in Europe, which is the European Green Deal. Uh, I will then um, explain um, uh, in a few minutes uh, where we stand in terms of innovation. Uh, Europe is doing a bit better on innovation than we sometimes think ourselves. I will then also give you a brief overview of uh, Horizon Europe, which is at EU level uh, the research and innovation toolbox uh, under which we do research and innovation in Europe. And I will then try to connect all of that back to um, economic security in, in a rather focused manner around key uh, dependencies um, and uh, key dependencies on our supply chains in Japan and in Europe particularly around um, net zero industries and around critical raw materials. And I will, of course, finish by giving you a, a, a short um, glimpse, but you followed it uh, as much as uh, we have done it in the EU Embassy, a short glimpse of the summit outcome and try to connect it to um, the discussion of today, including, of course, um, uh, Japan's uh, future association to Horizon Europe. So, if I, and I have slides, uh, which is a bit uncommon for me, but I will try my best um, and kick off with, indeed, the uh, European Union Green Deal. So that gives you a bit of uh, an overview of the architecture of that uh, European Green Deal. Don't worry, I'm not going to present the slide in any detail. I think what is really important here to underline is that um, the European Union decided uh, in 2019, uh, when a new policy cycle opened with European election, a new commission, uh, the European Council also coming together, decided to put at the center as a compass of public policy in Europe, the European Green Deal. So uh, the transformation of our societies, our economies um, in mobility, energy, agriculture, industry, to, to name a few, around the challenge of uh, climate um, mitigation and adaptation, but of course also the um, deep uh, biodiversity uh, and environmental degradation, which the world and Europe as well uh, know today. So these are uh, systemic challenges to humanity, not to Europe particularly, um, and in the European Union over the last decades, but with this key acceleration a few years ago, this is really at the center of our policy making. And I'm saying this because it's presented as being the compass for our economic growth policies. It's at the heart of our industrial policy. And it is very much, of course, shaped and shapes also our security and external policy. So it's really the compass of uh, public policy making. And we are therefore also deploying um, a set of, of instruments which is quite large, probably larger than anyone anywhere else in the world, uh, not just more ambitious because we are looking effectively at a 55% um, reduction of CO2 by, by 2030. I think no one has that uh, level of target. But we also deploy a very large toolbox. We have, um, of course, very significant funding under very many different um, EU instruments. Um, recently, in the context of the recovery of the pandemic, uh, we also deployed additional funding largely focused on that um, uh, European uh, transformation, so significant funding, and that to an extent is um, uh, now very similar uh, in the United States, which is uh, putting, I mean, large amounts um, of funding under the Inflation Reduction Act on similar uh, technology and industrial transformations not always very easy to organize in terms of uh, public uh, support to industries, and that was discussed uh, under the Japanese um, leadership in the G7, but it is also a very welcome development, accelerating uh, transformations um, uh, in the US. So 
a lot of funding also in Europe. But beyond the funding, uh, as is always the case in Europe, we also have a very strong regulatory setup and, um, and regulatory targets uh, which ensure that uh, public policy design but also behavior of industry, of economic actors, and in some cases beyond that also regional um, uh, governments and, and local authorities, that the behavior and the choices are framed under these regulatory frameworks and in many cases rather hard regulatory obligations. So we go much beyond guidelines and policy objectives. We put in law, um, in the climate law, which was adopted last year, these objectives in terms of CO2, and we've also now um, in the nature restoration law, which has been very controversial in the European Parliament, there will also be uh, hard um, uh, objectives in terms of environment and biodiversity. So the European Green Deal is really at the, at the heart of policymaking, a large toolbox, and a toolbox which beyond funding, industrial policy, regulatory frameworks, also of course looks very much at technology, it's very clear that the transformations which we are aiming at, uh, you are aiming at here in Japan and we are aiming at in the European Union, will also need significant um, uh, technology uh, improvements and changes and changes of paradigms in some industries. And therefore, um, the European research and innovation effort is also very largely uh, targeted at providing uh, instruments, solutions uh, for that uh, green transformation. So I'm going to now go through um, a, a few elements on, on innovation policy, because I know that many of you are interested in innovation policy and research policy. So, and I will connect it then back again to the Green Deal um, uh, later during my presentation. So let me briefly start with um, a, a very recent um, uh, policy paper and, ben and, 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 and economic uh, analysis document which we produce on a regular basis, the European Innovation Scoreboard. It's publicly um, available, of course. You can find it uh, on the delegation um, uh, website and on all commission websites. And we are every year um, uh, ranking uh, the position of, of individual member states, as, as you can see here on the map, but not just the uh, static position, also the developments uh, over time. And as we are, of course, a, a, a political project, we are trying to do it in a constructive and positive manner. And as you can see, we have ranked a member state according to the union average between le innovation leaders and emerging innovators. And uh, you can see on the map here the rather strong diversity of starting positions in the European Union. It's a diversity which exists in innovation, uh, but it also exists in research. It's a diversity which is, of course, sometimes a challenge for policymaking and for outcomes. It's also uh, certainly uh, a richness to have so many different um, uh, views and positions to create uh, the diversity needed for new ideas and technologies to emerge. But in a nutshell, on innovation, uh, it is the, the, the Nordic countries um, and then to a large extent um, uh, Benelux, which are really leading uh, with um, Germany, France and Austria and Ireland, which are also strong innovators. And then you have um, in, in the rest of Europe um, um, many member states which are progressively uh, catching up. We also, have, we also do in this uh, scoreboard uh, a ranking of uh, Europe in the broader international competition. So you can see it here on the slide. Uh, on the left hand, uh, Mexico. On the right hand side, um, uh, South Korea. And the European Union at 100. We are, of course, in our own uh, scoreboard, the reference point. Uh, we are on par with uh, Japan and um, not that far away from Australia. Of course, the US and Canada are doing better uh, than we are. So that's the static position. What is more interesting is, of course, the, um, what is happening over time and the performance change um, between 16 and today in the last eight years, nine, nine years, eight years, seven years. And what is, of course, particularly spectacular here is the progress of China. I think you know, all the, you know that, we know that, but it's um, rather spectacular um, in, in, in comparison. Uh, but then also uh, the fact that the EU continues to progress um, uh, in line um, uh, not so far from the US in the end, uh, and, um, and we continue to progress also between 22 and uh, 23. So as said, uh, Europe and Japan, we are on, 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 a, on a similar uh, level. Uh, maybe one word just to, to give you a sense of how we, 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 we get to that score. Huh? Uh, the indicators used are 
human resources, for example, um, population with tertiary education. We have uh, uh, digitalization, what is the broadband uh, penetration. We have finance and venture capital, R&D expenditure. Uh, we have um, also data on uh, publications. Um, we have data on patents, uh, so data which would not surprise you, but just to say that the the data set is, is, is a long-term data set and covering, indeed, uh, very many indicators. I must say, um, I, I know this uh, scoreboard now for many years. I, I'm not entirely sure how, um, how criticized it is in international discussions. I'm not aware that it is, uh, and so I suppose it is relatively uh, robust. So the European Union, I think, is well known uh, for being uh, a strong uh, science uh, powerhouse, and if you look at Nobel Prizes um, uh, of the last years, in fact, we probably are the best in science these days, largely because we created the European Research Council 10 years ago, and that has promoted outstanding cutting-edge uh, science, but we are also um, increasingly uh, being very relevant on uh, innovation. I think what, um, uh, maybe i just come back a second, what maybe characterizes European innovation, uh, and I'm sure we'll discuss it uh, uh, later in the question and answers, is uh, a very strong uh, science and engineering basis. So we are, we are really strong on life sciences, on, on, on biotech, and also increasingly on what is called deep tech. So that's certainly a, a, a real asset, including with a strong university basis. Uh, but where we are, of course, still lagging behind is, uh, even if there are a number of instruments in place to start to catch up, is in terms of um, venture capital and, um, and venture capital financing. And that is, I think, very much also an issue of the non-full non integration yet of our uh, capital markets um, at EU level. We have a banking union which is very integrated, but the capital markets less at this uh, stage. And so from that point of view, there is still quite a bit more which, uh, which certainly can be done, but we are, as you can see on this uh, graph, uh, not in uh, too bad a place. So um, this is, of course, all done largely at, um, at national level. Uh, the European Union is 27 member states. I mean, not so long ago we were 28. Um, um, and in fact, the United Kingdom remains very closely connected to the research and innovation European reality, being shortly again associated to Horizon Europe. But we are 27 member states with, um, of course, 27 innovation and research ecosystems, 27 national funding systems, uh, which exist and, um, and generate research and innovation at national level. But to bind this all together, to create, if you want, a critical mass, and to extract the best of this diversity across the European Union, we also have uh, a European level program, uh, which is uh, today called Horizon Europe. It's uh, 100 um, billion euros. Um, it's, uh, I'm told, the biggest in the world. Uh, and it is indeed um, uh, representing uh, around 8 or 9% of research and innovation public funding in Europe. But in terms of project funding, it's probably about a quarter of uh, project funding available across the European Union. So a very strong structuring uh, impact um, at EU level. So that program is, uh, as all research programs, too complex. So here again, a slide which um, I'm not going to, to detail uh, too much, but just to say that essentially what uh, Horizon Europe is about is supporting basic research, the best one in the world, with the European Research Council in particular, but also mobility of research with Maris Kodoska Curie, which are fellowships allowing um, postgrads to operate across the 27 member states, and in fact also with third countries, and Japan is making use of these um, uh, research fellowships uh, to an extent, which is very, very positive. So uh, blue sky research of the highest possible level with the European Research Council and a lot of mobility. Then we have a pillar on innovation, to which I will come back in a moment, the third pillar. But the heart of Horizon Europe, uh, pillar two in this uh, slide, is um, applied research, in fact, around the key challenges which are those of, of Europe and, as you can see on the slide, essentially uh, are very much shared also by our like-minded partners and in Japan as well. Health, um, digital, industry, climate, energy, mobility, 
agriculture environment. I mean, these are all areas where our societies, our economies are transforming and where, as I said earlier on, research and innovation is, of course, a key driver for solutions. So that pillar two, global challenges, is the heart of the program. It's about half of the funding. And it has um, three interesting um, features. Uh, the first one is the research topics. So what research do we fund there? How do we uh, create these topics? And the, the way we're doing it under Horizon Europe is in a process which we have labeled co-creation, where within the European Commission, to begin with, the discussion is taking place between those which do research and innovation on the one hand, so the research department, but also all other policy departments of the Commission. So the choices are not made by the science people, the choice is made jointly in co-creation, so on par between the science people, those which, which we, know is, we know research, we know the cutting edge of research, we know the needs for the next level, but we contrast that with the immediate policy needs in all the other policy areas, and ideally in a cross-cutting manner. So we have put in place in the Commission a very, a very robust governance uh, setup, which um, pushes everyone into that collective creation modality. Not easy, time-consuming, not necessarily always ideal in terms of process, but which has the immense added value of ensuring that when you make a choice on, on digital research, for example, this is not just the cutting edge uh, element of one industry, but also covers the need of regulation in AI or in quantum, for example, and you manage to combine the two. And obviously on climate, energy, and mobility, very much uh, uh, plugged into uh, the need for solutions for the European uh, Green Deal. So that's within uh, the European Commission, which is really uh, the platform for the program. But we do the same with the outside world. So we work in the same manner with member states and also countries which are associated to the program. Norway, for example, Ukraine, for example, tomorrow the United Kingdom, tomorrow New Zealand. So they are around the table with us looking at these research uh, priorities and also with uh, uh, universities, research organizations, and the broader set of partners which are working with the European Commission. Again, a very challenging process, uh, which at the end produces every year, uh, I mean dozens, if not hundreds, of research topics, which are then put out for consortia to bid for these projects. So that's the first um, uh, key dimension. The second key dimension is indeed these consortia. I mean, this is really the added value of Horizon Europe in Europe, is that we fund these applied research topics, not for one university or one research organization, but we ask consortia to come together across EU member states. Usually we would have typically between eight and 12 players, and they then prepare a proposal on the basis of the topic which is presented and compete between consortia. Very competitive, it's a very competitive program. We, we fund one in six, one in eight proposals only. But with that, we then are able to fund with a lot of money. So a project is between five and 15 million euros. And we have then the best research across the European Union, which is both the best in absolute terms, but also the best because it comes from different scientific and innovation cultures, and we can then complement uh, one with another. And that's essentially the DNA of uh, Horizon Europe. And the third feature uh, is uh, partnerships with industry. So if I can uh, just move to the next slide, which is here. Uh, we have also under that second pillar uh, established 49 European partnerships. So here again, too many to list, huh? but we have, for example, one on clean hydrogen or, or clean aviation under a cluster five in the middle of the slide. And on the clean aviation, um, which is one where, where we, we worked uh, very hard with, um, with European, um, European, uh, European aviation industry, Airbus, uh, uh, but also um, uh, with uh, Dassault, with um, the, 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 the motor, the engine industry in Europe, the, the universities in, in, in aeronautics. We have established a partnership where uh, the industry is putting four or five billion euros. The program is putting three, three and a half from memory. So it's a, it's a partnership of around 10 billion euros, 
where the purpose of the partnership is to develop the range of aircrafts which will be low carbon or zero carbon. So this is, this is really one partnership where industry is coming together. They can't do this at industry level. They can't do it at national level. They can only do it at EU level. And they hope with this partnership to really get Europe equipped with the range of aircrafts allowing us to decarbonize also aviation in the 30s and 40s. So sustainable aviation fuels are researched somewhere else. That's very good. Industry does a lot of it. It's a, lot, it's a big topic in Japan as well. That's good. But that's not going to decarbonize aviation uh, fully. And therefore, this partnership is trying to complement it with hydrogen, electric, and other uh, cutting edge and new technologies. There are many more examples of these partnerships. And these partnerships have also the added um, uh, attraction that they bring together industry with, in many cases, also European national administrations, which can therefore have a, a regulatory dialogue be between research and administration. So the re research takes place. It informs future regulation. Sometimes regulators themselves are involved in the partnership, and we can therefore ensure that um, as a cutting edge research is funded, is deployed, takes place, it's also very much anchored in policy possibilities for the future. Um, now back to the third pillar and innovative Europe, and I will be a bit faster on this one. Um, so this is a new pillar. This was created in Horizon Europe uh, back in 2018 uh, on the assumption that we need to do more on innovation in Europe. So we have in particular uh, created the European Innovation Council, uh, which is now four years old. And the European Innovation Council is, is essentially the innovation uh, leg, um, which is the counterpart of the European Research Council. So the European Research Council I mentioned already a few times. It's um, Europe's Nobel Prize factory. Um, and in, in effect, European Research Council funded researchers now are getting Nobel Prizes every year. Let's hope it continues. Uh, you have to be a bit careful. Uh, the sample is very small. These are exceptional um, people, obviously. But still, the European Research Council is funding research leading to Nobel Prizes uh, on a yearly basis th th these days. And we hope that the European Innovation Council can do the same and become Europe's um, uh, unicorn factory. And the idea here is to uh, have the most uh, innovative deep tech startups compete for scale-up funding. And the funding can be very generous, 5, 10 million euros. And the added value of the European Innovation Council is that it provides, on the one hand, grant funding. And grant funding is often very much needed, including at this innovation stage when you are in deep tech, because you still have research to validate. So there's still grant relevant research to take to do. So that's the grant component. But the European Innovation Council also takes equity in these uh, startups. And by taking equity, it can also be an anchor to rally additional investors and then have a very significant leverage effect. So the European Innovation Council is going to be uh, 10 billion euros for, for, for the period of the program until 2027. And we very much um, expect that this European Innovation Council will make a big, big difference uh, for many companies um, uh, which will then deploy uh, their solutions um, in Europe, but of course certainly in other markets uh, as well. So that was for, that was um, the, I, I'm, I'm sorry to be, I hope I'm not, I'm not too fast. I'm very fast, it's no? Okay. It's, it's okay. okay, you think it's, it, it, it works for you guys? Good. Uh, so um, this was a, a snapshot of our toolbox, um, uh, the European Union level toolbox. Huh? As I said early on, this is, of course, anchored in national system and brings together also resources coming from the national level. So uh, research and innovation is happening in Europe uh, at scale and at uh, quality. Uh, we hope to do better. We hope to do better, including by teaming up uh, with Japan. But I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, moving to um, the Green Deal, but connecting it to economic security, which is the, the second dimension of this short presentation. Uh, with the uh, European Union Net Zero Industry Act and, in a moment, the Critical Raw Materials Act. I mean, this is essentially um, about uh, taking a hard look at um, critical supply chains, critical supply chains for our green transformation, our net zero uh, path in Europe, 
and ensuring that we reduce uh, our dependency on one specific supplier, which I don't think I need to identify as such in this presentation. And so this the, the, the issue here is um, not so much uh, in the logic of uh, industrial policy in the narrow sense. We want to create our industry. I think we are um, very uh, happy in Europe to be a part of a, of a multilateral trade world order under the WTO. This has served our development very well over the last decades. And I think Europe's uh, market has served the development of many other parts of the world very well too. But at the same time, we are today in a situation like the, which is the same case, in, and it's a near copy and paste, uh, for Japan, we are in a situation of strategic dependency on one supplier. We have, uh, in the Ukraine war, uh, made the uh, experience of uh, overly to be overly dependent in energy on Russia. This has been, of course, extremely difficult, uh, costly, politically surprisingly well, m well managed in reality. We, in the end, we managed to uh, exit dependency on, on pipeline gas, uh, essentially, and largely on oil as well in a, in a matter of a few months. This was, I think, uh, a remarkable development. I, we, we can come back to it in the, in the discussion later on. But this is really the illustration that strategic dependencies are, are really a, 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 real, a, a real worry to be had. Um, and of course, I'm not um, here uh, wanting to make any parallel between Russia and other uh, uh, countries on which we are dependent. But the dependency in itself uh, is identified as a highly critical. And that is very much the discussion which we had um, in the G7 under, under your leadership uh, in, uh, up to Hiroshima and Hiroshima, and is also very much the discussion between Japan and the European Union. So the Net Zero Industry Act is about that. How do we... Um, reduce our key critical dependencies. And there are essentially uh, three ways of doing that. Um, firstly, by uh, creating a better industry base. Uh, you are doing it, we are doing it as well. Uh, I mean, and the areas are solar, wind, battery, heat pumps, uh, electrolyzers um, in particular. So we, we will, under that um, policy framework, uh, aim at developing uh, a European industrial basis. That's one way of doing it. A second way of doing it is also to team up with like-minded partners. Uh, the supply chains created in Japan in these areas, they de-risk ours because you are a reliable, trustworthy commercial and political partner. So that's very positive. And in some cases, uh, I think there will also be space to work together on creating, uh, on working on supply chains. And thirdly is, of course, again, technology, because some of these dependencies are immediate dependencies on existing technologies. And you can, in terms of research, develop alternative technologies, and with that also reduce your critical uh, dependencies. And I think the best example here is uh, solar technologies where um, uh, solar, the solar supply chain was put on the export control list um, uh, in China in November last year. Uh, China has not acted on it uh, yet, but it's on the export control uh, list, and it could therefore be enacted uh, in cases um, uh, quite rapidly. And I think this should really spur uh, the Europeans, and I would argue Europe with Japan or Japan with Europe, uh, to look at the research which is happening today and seeing how far uh, that research could be uh, accelerated and the outcomes of that research scaled up into alternative um, industrial supply chains. So that's for the Net uh, Zero Industry Act, and I think I'm still kind of on time. Um, the, same, uh, the same line of argumentation, and you know it better than I do, in fact, most of you listening uh, to this presentation is in critical uh, raw materials. I mean, here again, um, uh, Japan is entering uh, partnerships with, uh, with like-minded like Aust Australia, the Europeans, we are doing that with Canada. We are both working uh, with the US and with others. Uh, we are working with Latin America. We just had a summit in Brussels, um, uh, also with Africa, to, to, to explore partnerships on mining and processing to ensure that uh, there is more value staying in, our, in, in partner countries, but also to ensure that um, the dependency on, on, on just one uh, uh, processing uh, country is, is reduced. So all these are ongoing discussions. Uh, and under the Critical Raw Materials Act, again, we want to develop capacities in Europe. 
mining to an extent, processing to an extent, but we also want to partner internationally uh, to develop these supply chains. And here again, technology is key because in some of these raw materials are critical today, but alternatives are being researched and, can, and that research can be accelerated and it's implementation through innovation as well so that um, dependencies can be reduced. And I, uh, I'm not going to cover in any detail now the third way, which is recycling, which of course will also be particularly important. You are, I think many of you are certainly involved in discussions on batteries recycling, uh, where Europe's, uh, Europe is leading the way in terms of uh, regulation. So all the areas which, um, where developments are happening uh, in Europe um, fast um, and with a lot of uh, political capital put into them and resources, uh, as I said at the outset, and I think the same goes, of course, for Japan. Now, all this was discussed um, uh, last week, as tanabe san said. Uh, the EU-Japan summit took place in Brussels on the 13th uh, uh, with these um, uh, three uh, leaders. Um, uh, I must say, uh, I, I, which I attended, of course, um, together with Masaki-san, my, my partner uh, in Brussels. Uh, and this was, I think, a particularly productive summit. Um, I mean, my own uh, assessment is that I think it was very much carried by the amazing G7 outcomes. Uh, I think the leadership of Japan in the G7 and Hiroshima has really allowed us collectively to create a, a political and conceptual framework for this new world which has emerged over the last two or three years. And that is then very much the basis also for uh, the bilateral relationship between uh, uh, Europe uh, and Japan. Uh, Frau von der Leyen at the end at the press conference said that um, uh, Japan and Europe uh, need each other more than ever and will act together uh, more than ever. And this is really um, the, the gist of uh, the summit uh, conclusions on the political side, of course, but also in these uh, very many areas which I'm trying to cover too fast um, today. And uh, be it under the Green Alliance uh, with hydrogen, wind, uh, batteries, uh, and other areas, be it under the digital partnership on uh, uh, chips, um, but also secure connectivity, uh, they are very concrete outcomes and expectations identified at the summit on which we will work together, uh, teams in Brussels, um, uh, teams uh, in Japan in industry and administration, and the embassy, the European embassy here, together with uh, EU member states, uh, will uh, very much um, uh, now have to work on very specific and very tangible areas of cooperation, which I find uh, particularly encouraging. I finish with, um, with this, um, uh, partnering in research and innovation. Um, uh, uh, Tamora-san expects it. Uh, he told me before we started, and I think um, I need to mention, indeed, um, the ongoing discussions on association of Japan to Horizon Europe. Um, this is a, a discussion which is now ongoing for a, a bit more than a year, um, which, which started formally after the summit of 2022, when leaders asked us to start exploring the possibility of Japan associating to Horizon Europe. This is something which is new. In past European programs, this was not possible. The only associated countries were our neighbors. But with Horizon Europe, in the context which we are discussing, uh, the Commission and Member States decided with the Parliament that also like-minded partners should be offered the possibility uh, to uh, participate in Horizon Europe. So there is no request for Japan to associate, it's an offer for Japan to associate. Um, I think our research uh, priorities overlap. Our complementarities in research excellence and innovation are striking. And it is therefore, uh, I find, very regrettable that there is so little research cooperation between Japan and the European Union. There is, of course, research happening at university level. There are some national programs which exist between Germany or Italy and, uh, and Japan. That is very good. But at EU level, there is hardly anything. And if I see that every year there are hundreds of EU projects which are funded, and we have every year five, six EU, uh, five, five or six Japanese participants. So it's not happening. The reason is quite simple. It's because uh, being part of a consortia is very challenging. It's very competitive. And the reason why we don't turn to Japanese partners for the consortia is not because you're not good. It's quite the contrary. We would 
Many consortia would like a Japanese participant, but it is that when we turn to a Japanese participant, we then ask him, if we were successful, would your part of the research, would you be able to fund it? And in many cases, unless there is a, a bureaucratic decision at the outset, the Japanese participant can never say yes. And therefore, uh, he will not be part of the uh, consortia as it's being set up. This very central problem is solved with association. If Japan associates to the program, Japanese participants in the program are funded by the program. So the issue of funding simply disappears, and you become, as uh, Tokyo University or Tohoku or, or Ryushu University, you become like Berlin University, like La Sorbonne, or, or any other European partner. You are on par and treated exactly the same in terms of uh, of mechanisms under the program. That would be a game changer. It, of course, brings with it a number of practical problems, uh, which we are continuing to discuss. And I'm sure we will find solutions to many of these problems. And I very much hope that, like New Zealand, which has now signed an agreement, like Canada, with which we have a deal, like Korea, with which we negotiate, I very much hope that um, in, the, in the short term, uh, we will be able to start these negotiations, because I think that uh, Europe has a lot uh, to benefit from having Japanese participants, and I think Japanese uh, participants have a lot to benefit from being associated to these very big consortia, which work on the research topics which are key for our societal transformations and are at the heart of the political discussions, both in Japan and in the European Union. Voila, j'arrête. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, thank you very much for introducing uh, European strategies, uh, including uh, European Green Deal, uh, EU uh, innovation policy, and the EU economic security strategies uh, like Net Zero Industry Act and Critical Raw Materials Act. And uh, you have uh, touched upon the recent uh, EU-Japan summit and generally the state of uh, EU-Japan uh, relationship. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your constructive, uh, very positive uh, message.